Have we finally put a finger on the real D.B. Cooper? Hey friends, how you doing? Eric Eulis here once again to talk about the mystery of D.B. Cooper. And uh, today I want to talk about something that we've all been kind of talking about the last couple of weeks, and that is some of the newer evidence, but specifically a person of interest that I've identified that I believe that the evidence strongly points to. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I held a press conference in Vancouver, Washington, talking about the evidence and talking about this person of interest, a guy named Vince Peterson. And, uh, and I put a little bit of meat on the bones, kind of laid out in some detail exactly how I arrived at those conclusions. And it's important to note that this is all being driven by science. This isn't just pulling things out of thin air. This is driven by science. And in particular, the particles that were found upon D.B. Cooper's clip-on tie. Again, that clip-on tie uh, that looks just like this right here, that clip-on tie that was left behind on the jet and recovered by law enforcement in Reno, Nevada. Again, they analyzed the tie back in 1971, didn't come up with much. It was 1971, what are you going to really come up with? I think they were looking for fingerprints, things of that nature, just didn't come up with much. But in later years, we've had the opportunity to take that tie and analyze particles that came from the tie under an electron microscope. And specifically in 2017, there was a company called McCrone Labs based in Chicago, world famous, that actually uh, looked at some of the particles, analyzed some of the particles that came from D.B. Cooper's tie. They looked at it underneath an electron, looked at them underneath uh, an electron microscope or with an electron microscope. I'll get that out, man, it's a rough day. Uh, Thanksgiving, <laughs> or just past Thanksgiving. But either way, uh, and what they discovered is something north of 100,000 particles. Now, very importantly, these particles were itemized in an Excel spreadsheet. So all these particles are listed, and also, critically, the chemical signature for these individual particles is also listed. So uh, one thing I started to do probably about six months ago was go through this Excel spreadsheet, these actually multiple Excel spreadsheets, looking at all these particles. I was looking for something unique, something rare, something one of a kind, something that I called commercial DNA. In effect, just as you know, human DNA can point to a specific individual, my thought is, hey, maybe I could find something very unique, very rare, very specific that points to a specific company. And indeed, I did find that in the name of three particles of a titanium and antimony alloy. Now, these three particles are exceptionally rare. Titanium and antimony is exceptionally rare, especially of the specific chemical balance that we're talking about here. And uh, more importantly, it does not appear that it was ever commercially produced or commercially disseminated. And there are a couple of patents, there are a few patents that have been identified that point to a specific company uh, called Remcru Titanium, later known as Crucible Steel, that actually uh, was researching and analyzing and messing with this titanium and, and antimony alloy. So uh, what I'm getting at here is it does appear to indicate that the only possible place in the world that these titanium and antimony particles could have come from was rem crew titanium again later known as crucible steel and um this got me thinking uh, i reached out to uh, a guy who worked at rem crew back in the day from the 50s up into the 90s he was actually a supervisor and he worked uh, in the titanium research department because my understanding or my belief was talking to, after talking with some other people is that D.B. Cooper probably came from this titanium research lab. And the reason why is because in addition to the three very unique particles I found on the tie related to the titanium and antimony alloy, there are several other titanium particles, some of which are alloyed, some of which are pure. And there is a bunch of other stuff on the tie as well, stainless steel, aluminum, rare earth elements, and very importantly, an abundant amount of salt. And I'm not talking table salt, the kind of stuff you would find at McDonald's, but salt that's more of a, an industrial type of salt, something that you wouldn't eat. So let's hold on to that thought for a minute here. So um, I got a hold of a, a gentleman, again, uh, 90 years old, uh, who worked in this division and learned a lot from him about 
Rem Crew Titanium's uh, research lab. Importantly, I discovered that there were like eight guys that worked in the research lab. That's it. We're talking a universe of eight engineers. That is it. And also very importantly is these guys wore ties regularly to work because D.B. Cooper had to be wearing a tie at the time that he picked up these particles and all the other things on the tie. So that's important to note. We need to have somebody that was actually wearing a tie at work. And I did confirm that the, the engineers actually did wear ties. Now there were several assistants as well, but the assistants did not wear ties. So that means that we can zero in and focus in on specifically the researchers, science, scientists, engineers, whatever you want to call them, you know, these eight guys that worked at REM Crew Titanium. And uh, I had a conversation with the guy and learned a lot again, as I mentioned about uh, the, the Titanium Research Lab. One thing, they experimented with a lot of different metals, things of that nature, which is kind of what I expect and kind of what I want to see. Not only to titanium, but, you know, they dealt with stainless steel and a variety of other things, components and things that went into aircraft and military aircraft, including even submarines. So that kind of thing. They also had a number of contracts with Boeing, which I think is critically important. They not only supplied specialty metals for Boeing's you know, military aircraft, but also their commercial aircraft as well, and specifically the Boeing 727, which of course is the type of jet that D.B. Cooper actually jumped from. So um, uh, among those things, among learning about all that other stuff there, I learned that uh, there were a couple of these guys that would occasionally travel to Boeing in some of their other contracts on a regular basis, uh, doing whatever they do. Uh, and this is obviously critically important in my mind as well, because it appears to me that D.B. Cooper definitely had some familiarity with not only the Seattle region, but Boeing and specifically the Boeing 727. So having somebody that had been up in that area or traveled there on a regular basis, but didn't live there, in my mind was actually critically important. And uh, so that's, you know, again, something worth keeping in mind and noting. These are the kind of things that I wanna hear and this is kind of what I would expect to hear from, uh, you know, D.B. Cooper's world. And uh, so I talked to the supervisor and I said, you know, hey, listen, or the former supervisor, I said, this is what we're looking at in terms of D.B. Cooper. We're looking at a guy, you know, he's about six foot one. This is based upon witness testimony. You know, a guy who's thin, a guy who's in good shape. He's not, you know, not overweight or anything like that. A guy that's basically in his mid 40s to about 50 years of age. Uh, and we know based upon the sketches, or at least the, the Bing Crosby sketch, which is the original one, which is the one I think is really the closest to the truth, uh, he had kind of that Bing Crosby-esque kind of look, a little bit higher, head, hairline, that type of thing. Wasn't bald, uh, but you know, that, that type of thing. And of course, D.B. Cooper, by some of the witnesses, is noted as having an olive complexion, a swarthy complexion. Uh, that's up for uh, interpretation because uh, I've actually looked into this quite a bit. And, you know, like, for example, if I uh, dyed my hair dark, like black, if I literally dyed my hair black and my eyebrows black and everything else and got rid of this thing here, uh, I would argue that I actually kind of look like I have sort of a olive complexion as well. So, you know, that or having a suntan, things of that nature, it's, it's kind of easy to fudge on that a little bit. So what I'm getting at here is I'm not necessarily looking at somebody that's of Latin American heritage or Native American heritage or Italian heritage or anything like that. I think we can safely say we're not rolling with some guy who's from Ireland who's got, you know, bright red hair and freckles and, you know, is pasty white. I, I think, you know, we can safely say that but I wouldn't get too caught up in the olive complexion thing or the swarthy complexion thing. But having said all that, I talked to the guy and said, this is who we're looking for. And he pointed to one person and one person alone. He said, Vince Peterson. And I consider that critically important because this guy knew the people that worked in the titanium lab and knew them well. And he knew their demeanor. He knew, you know, obviously a lot about these people. And that's the person that he pointed out was Vince Peterson, who he knew actually quite well, obviously. 
Importantly, he said that he had actually personally traveled with Vince Peterson to Boeing on a, a couple of occasions and actually been on the, the, the floor, the manufacturing floor at Boeing. And uh, moreover, I know that Vince Peterson also traveled to Boeing on other occasions as well for business. So again, these are the kind of things that I expect to see in a DB Cooper. So um, having you know heard the name Vince Peterson for the first time, I started digging into this guy. Who is this guy? Let's you know. Let me see what I can find out about him. And uh, and I was as time went on, and I started looking at the various boxes and so forth that need to be checked. I was I was thinking this guy is really kind of looking an awful lot like what I expect DB Cooper to look like. Now let me throw up a picture here, the picture that, that we kind of started this thing off with. And it's a side-by-side -side picture of the famous Bing Crosby sketch wearing the, the sunglasses with Vince Peterson. Now, bear in mind here, this is Vince Peterson in the 90s. So this is, a, you know, Vince Peterson at this point, he's probably 74 years of age, something like that, you know, more than two decades after the skyjacking. So because the guy's obviously a little older looking and got gray in his hair and stuff like that, you know, let's not get too caught in the weeds like, hey, his hair is light and it wasn't dark, whatever. Again, consider this is a Peterson as a, as a much older individual. Let me throw up another picture here, courtesy of Ryan Burns, by the way, uh, of Vince Peterson as well. And this is him, uh, December 1959. So Peterson would have been 40 years of age in this picture. A couple of things to note, he's got dark hair, people. He's got dark hair in this picture, uh, obviously very conservatively cut. Uh, I noticed his ears also look, uh, you know, smaller than they did in, in the, uh, the other picture where he's much older, uh, you know, because obviously ears and noses and those kind of things continue to grow. But uh, yeah, that's Vince Peterson, again, 40 years of age, December of 1959. So, you know, we're talking basically 12 years before the skyjacking took place. So uh, FYI here, Vince Peterson was 52 years of age at the time of the skyjacking, November 24th, 1971. Uh, Vince Peterson is a native of New York. I uh, did not have an accent. A lot of people ask about that. He did not have an accent. Uh, you know, served in uh, World War II in the Merchant Marines, uh, ended up uh, moving to Washington, D.C. after his service there was complete. Uh, met his wife, got married to his wife there, who interestingly actually worked for the FBI. Now she was not an agent because they did not have female agents back then, but she did work for the FBI. Then the Petersons moved up to uh, mid Midland, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, for Mr. as Mr. Peterson started working for this Rem Crew Titanium. Uh, Midland is where Rem Crew Titanium was headquartered at that time, and uh, he was there for a number of years, and then. Uh, uh, Rem Crew, again, later by this time, Crucible Steel, decided to build a separate research lab uh, that housed the titanium uh, division uh, just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, an area called Robinson Township. And uh, they built the building, they built this building, here's a picture of it, uh, in 1964. So it became operational in 1964. So Peterson actually moved to the Pittsburgh area with his family in 1964 and started working for them in 1964. Now, what's interesting about that 1964 date is, is a few things. First of all, uh, one of the patents, one of the titanium and antimony patents that uh, has been identified uh, was filed in 1965, actually March of 1965. So this is, you know, immediately after or a year or so after this particular facility opened. Uh, in the suburb of Pit suburbs of Pittsburgh. Uh, the other thing is the tie itself. D.B. Cooper's clip-on tie was manufactured between 1962 and 1964. And that means in all likelihood that it was sold, and it was sold exclusively at J.C. Penney between 1962 and 1965. So the timing of the tie, the tie purchase, dovetails very nicely with when this new building opened up, with this new research lab when that opened up, and also with the timing of that titanium antimony alloy that was obviously worked on there. So that's critically important, and I think it's notable. Another interesting thing to consider 
relates to the Boeing 727. The Boeing 727 itself started really being developed around 1960 and basically was, was delivered, finally delivered to Eastern Airlines and operational as of February 1st, 1964. So there we are again with that 1964 date that just seems to kind of pop up as far as this goes. Uh, so I'm um, theorizing that D.B. Cooper and let's say Vince Peterson here moving to Pittsburgh, starting in his new position in the Titanium Lab in the new facility in 1964, went to the local J.C. Penney and there was one very close by about 20 minutes away uh, at the mall, picked up a new you know clip on tie and started wearing that and bingo, managed to get this you know, this titanium and antimony alloy on his tie and the other particles and so forth on his tie. Now, one of the other very interesting things about Vince Peterson is I came across some uh, uh, research papers that he wrote with respect to the effects, the corrosive effects of salt on titanium. He's written extensively about this and obviously researched this extensively. Why that's critically important is because, remember, there was a fair amount of salt found on the tie. So this may well explain that salt being on the tie in that Mr. Peterson was actually studying, again, the effects of the corrosive effects of salt on titanium. It's something he, he studied extensively and, uh, and wrote about extensively. In fact, the last document that he wrote related to that came out and I believe it was April of 1971. So a couple things to note, uh, the uh, titanium and, and specialty metals sector in Boeing itself uh, underwent a significant uh, depression beginning in 1971. Tens of thousands of people, not only at Boeing lost their jobs, but also Western Pennsylvania and in the specialty metals area, tens of thousands of uh, workers lost their jobs beginning in, in early 71 uh, or were idled. In other words, they weren't working nearly as much. And that could have had a, a you know, presumably a significant economic impact on all the workers there. Now, I don't know for sure how this actually affected Peterson. And what I'm getting at is I don't know if, if Vince Peterson was actually laid off or if he is idled or what have you. I've been unable to find that out. But it's hard to imagine that this guy was not impacted in some manner. So that, that may have had something that may have played a part as far as this entire thing is concerned. And importantly, things started to turn around. About a year later, things started to turn around in 72 and they started hiring people back, which is, which is also something that I kind of expect from D.B. Cooper. And the reason why I say that is because... Uh, it doesn't appear the money was spent. At least all of the money was spent. Perhaps some of it was was spent, but it doesn't appear that all of it was spent. And the question is why, you know? And I've theorized that something must have happened. Perhaps something happened in his his particular position. Maybe he had a pink slip in hand, in hand felt jammed up financially, and uh, and obviously managed to skyjack a jet because this was his ticket out but then maybe again you know six seven months later things started to change he got his job back whatever the case may happen to be and he kind of figured you know what let me just leave well enough and alone as far as this money is concerned because if there's one thing i've said this before if there's one thing that we can say with relative certainty is that the one thing that db cooper whoever this guy was valued more than the two hundred thousand bucks in cash i'm sure it was his freedom so uh, playing it safe makes an awful lot of sense. I don't think the guy would have thrown it in the fire pit and burned it, but it, I can see him sort of stashing it aside somewhere and just going to work, you know, per regular, basically once it's back to, to regular and then just kind of leaving well enough alone. And who knows what happens with the money? Maybe some more of it's spent over time, maybe none of it's spent, I, I don't know. But it's, it's an interesting thing to consider in and of itself. So. A um, couple of things to note about Peterson again, 52 years old at the time of the skyjacking, which is consistent with, uh, with what the flight attendant said. The guy's from about 45 to 50, right around that range there. Vince Peterson was six foot one. This is critically important as well. I know a lot of people try to ignore that or ignore that, but you know, the, there are really four primary witnesses that I pay attention to related to this. Uh, 
three of them were the flight attendants, and then there was another one who was the gate agent who actually observed D.B. Cooper standing there at the gate for quite some time before the people, the passengers, actually boarded the jet. Two of the flight attendants said that D.B. Cooper was six feet tall. One of the flight attendants put his height at six foot one, and the gate agent said that his height was at least six foot one. So I think six foot one, that six foot, six foot one height is critically important here. It's worth considering that American men born during that time, right around the 1920s, only 10% of them were six foot or six foot one. So that's an important metric to apply because D.B. Cooper was relatively tall for a man of, of that time. And that, again, is reflected in the documents. And again, Mr. Peterson was six foot one at the time. Uh, Peterson worked extensively on titanium. That was his specialty. Worked on all kinds of titaniums, commercially pure titanium, various grades of titanium, and, and so forth. Uh, so this is kind of what I expect to see. But I think he worked in other, on other metals and other things as well. And one other thing that's critically important to consider is that when you look at D.B. Cooper's tie and the particles that were on D.B. Cooper's tie, there are really two broad categories of particles. There's very small particles that appear to have come from a research lab, and this is where these titanium antimony particles, particles come from. But there are also some particles that appear to have come from a shop, from some sort of sophisticated metal shop, because it's clear that when looking at some of these particles, for example, there's one that's got a, a piece of stainless steel with a, with a titanium smeared into it. That clearly involves some sort of mechanical application. There's some sort of mechanics at play. There's some sort of physics at play there. Plus there is a, a piece of aluminum, very finely coiled piece of aluminum, like a shaving of aluminum that came from like a drill bit or something of that nature. So it does appear that Cooper was around not only a research lab, but some sort of sophisticated, you know, tooling or metal shop where these types of mechanical applications would take place. Why this is important is because that Robinson lab that I referenced here uh, had a research lab, the titanium research lab on one part of the building and actually had a metal shop on the other side of the building. And the engineers would go between both the shop and the research lab. And the reason why, and this is directly from the, the former supervisor there, is because the, the engineers would develop things, metals, things of this nature, and then they would bring them over to the, uh, to the shop and they would be cold rolled and pressed and drilled and, and things of that nature. All the while, these guys, again, are wearing ties. So again, this makes sense when you consider a D.B. Cooper uh, having sort of both types of particles on his tie. And I think what makes Vince Peterson and Vince Peterson alone so compelling is the age is right, the height is right, the appearance is right. If you look at him, there's clearly a resemblance to, uh, to, the, to the Bing Crosby sketch and uh, his supervisor. His supervisor is the one who pointed him out. He didn't point anybody else out. He pointed Vince Peterson and Vince Peterson alone out. Now, I have been to Vince Peterson's old house. I've talked to his old neighbor. I've talked to the person who purchased Vince Peterson's house from him. People that knew Peterson, knew Peterson well, and talked with Peterson. I've also talked with Vince Peterson's son and gotten information from Vince Peterson's son. And the basic vibe I'm getting from this guy is he was kind of aloof. The family was kind of, you know, just sort of quiet and to themselves. He was a pretty aloof kind of a guy. Wasn't, you know, a big social butterfly or anything like that. And he's the kind of guy who uh, just felt like he could uh, do anything that needed to be done around the the house himself. For example, if there was some sort of plumbing issue or if there's some sort of electrical issue or something of that nature, he didn't call somebody. Vince Peterson didn't call somebody on the phone to come by and fix it. He would actually dive into a book. He would get a book, read about it, and he would do, do, do it himself. He was just sort of that kind of a person. And uh, so it's, it's just interesting to consider as far as that goes. So there are a number of other things as well that, that I think point to Vince Peterson pretty clearly. I won't get into those right now. I just wanted to kind of give you a, a quick and brief overview of 
of kind of Peterson and why it is that I'm focusing on Vince Peterson right now. Uh, as far as that press conference is concerned, the one that I uh, conducted about two, two, three weeks ago, uh, if you go on YouTube and you just search D.B. Cooper, it's going to come up near the, near the very top of the results. Uh, <clears throat> Fox 13 in Seattle actually uh, actually essentially broadcast most of, it, most of it or filmed most of it. It's like the first 12 or 15 minutes of it is filmed there. So it's worth checking out. So uh, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to shoot me an email, eric at ericulis.com. That's all I've got for you right now. And until next time, folks, cheers.